So, moving on to uh, our main uh, topic today, uh, we have uh, Harold Smith and uh, Keisha Davis. Um, they, they've been here twice now. Uh, they're in charge of uh, the Thompson 2020. Harold is the co-project manager for uh, Thompson 2020. And Keisha is the economic development officer for the city of Thompson. And uh, they are working in concert to uh, uh, come up with uh, some sort of a plan moving forward for the city uh, to 2020 and beyond. Uh, so we, we've heard uh, about the three buckets and the fourth one was added. So I'm going to uh, hand the floor over to uh, Harold and Keisha to give us an update uh, as to what has been uh, achieved since uh, we last met and uh, what are the plans moving forward. Sure. Yeah. I'll move to the podium because uh, Paul's got the microphone set yes. up there. And, uh, <laughs> Hear me okay, Paul? Great. Um, Happy New Year, everyone. It's great to see folks that uh, I see from time to time at surprising small communities, and yet it's still sometimes, uh, it takes a while sometimes before you run into people, and so it's great to see everybody out. Um, welcome, Chris, uh, to Back to Thompson. I, uh, I haven't crossed paths with Chris in a long time. I'm looking forward to connecting with you. I didn't make the meeting earlier today, but... Back in the day, uh, when I was in the land claims business, I would talk to Chris over coffee in the provincial building uh, on his way up doing exploration stuff. And he had the he had the tan vest on with all the pockets and the compass hanging from his from his jacket. And he was always up uh, heading into the bush to do exploration and doing doing work with uh, finding where there's minerals and trying to figure that stuff out. And so it's great to see. Um, congratulations on the on the job at at, uh, at Mines Branch director, I believe. Yes. So we'll look forward to connecting later on uh, whenever is uh, whenever's possible. Um, so just for the benefit, I, I apologize for people who have seen this pitch before. Uh, some of you had it probably twice in a span of a couple of days when we were around Small Business Week. Uh, but I'm going to give the 100,000 foot level explanation of Thompson 2020 just for those folks who haven't seen it yet. As we all know, uh, Thompson is going through uh, some significant changes this year in terms of the presence of, uh, of the mining industry and uh, Valley's operations. Um, and uh, uh, a partnership has formed with the City of Thompson, the Province of Manitoba, the Federal Government and Valet uh, to, to sort of lay out a bit of a plan for a transition. Um, Thompson has always been a community of opportunity, in my view, uh, a community of opportunity to live, work, learn, raise a family, invest, play, and retire. And uh, it's always been that. Uh, and one of our jobs, our job, core job of Thompson 2020 is to try to ensure that it remains that community. It means some changes, for sure. Uh, we're going we're gonna to have some, uh, some changes that we don't want to see, that we certainly didn't go looking for, but... Uh, we certainly are very optimistic that, that Thompson will remain that community of opportunity. It's not going to happen on its own. Uh, and so we are going to uh, be focusing on three main areas that are sort of dealing with the short-term uh, impacts. And those, so they're, they're divided into three projects. I'm not going to go through them sequentially because I'm going to save the back part of this presentation on Project 1, which is the first one, the most urgent one that we've been dealing with. So I'm going to start with Project number 2 and just give you a, a higher level update. If you'll recall, Project 2 was retain and attract residents, basically the amenities and quality of life in Thompson. Based on a survey that was done internally with Valet last year, a, a survey targeted at, at people uh, who are close to retirement, there were a number of amenities uh, that, that were identified um, that people uh, said are key to their decision about where, whether or not they want to relocate out of Thompson or whether they want to remain. And key to the, the key is what is important in that decision is what we, were, what we were trying to find out. So we've taken that survey and expanded it, and now we want to survey all residents in the community and ask them those questions. 
So our website has gone live uh, yesterday. Uh, Thompson2020.ca has a link on the website to a survey that is an expansion of the survey that Valley did internally uh, with a little bit more detail related to uh, healthcare services, uh, amenities in the community, as well as uh, what we call, the general term is lifestyle housing is what we're calling it. We're not just calling it cottaging because it, it's, it's bigger than that. And I'll talk about the whole lifestyle housing piece uh, shortly. So that survey is out there. We have not started to promote it yet other than me mentioning it today. Uh, we had a meeting, we have a team uh, of uh, some community members. We're all, we always welcome support from uh, community members, but we've got a small focus group of people who are going to, um, or sorry, a work team that are going to be sharing some of the burden of rolling out and promoting that survey. It's an online survey. We'll also be doing hard copies for people who don't want to go online. And we're also going to be arranging focus groups. Uh, groups of 10 to 20 people for a two-hour session uh, where we'll, we'll go through a facilitated session that will be parallel to the survey just to get some more context and color instead of just answering questions. So we'll still encourage people who are in the focus groups to fill out the survey, but we'll have the opportunity for discussion in those focus groups. Um, and so we want to get some real uh, feedback in there to drive those, the, uh, the planning for our community rooted in that question of what is important to you and your decision about, where to, about living in Thompson. Uh, and so that's sort of the community amenities side. I, we call that, their shorthand is, because we talk about these projects all the time, that's project 2B which is community amenities, about, about retaining and attract residents, and 2B is, is uh, looking at community amenities. So that's a real driver behind the survey. The other part of the survey is some more questions around lifestyle housing. That came out loud and clear in the survey that Valet did. Um, access to cottaging and large lot, like acreages, were really big uh, in potential retirees' decisions about, about staying in Thompson. So we're not waiting for the results from that survey. We, we expect we'll get some more detail. We're asking some more refined questions in the survey. Uh, and we'll be doing that through the, the, uh, the focus group. We, we expect we'll likely have a focus group just with the people who have signed up and come out to other cottaging presentations. Uh, but we are getting ahead of that one by working with Valet, uh, Manitoba Conservation, and a meeting this afternoon with Manitoba Hydro on potential areas that could be developed for, uh, for really three potential uses. One of them is lakefront cottaging. Uh, that one came through loud and clear. Acreages came through loud and clear. People who don't necessarily want, need lakefront, but they want, access, they want the ability to to buy and develop on a 10 acre parcel of land and to, and to develop that land. So we're identifying areas that will go into a public RFP to try to generate interest in, in developers, perhaps local investors, perhaps not, perhaps a co-op that wants to get together and develop uh, road access to, to an area to develop lots. Um, one of the things that we're we're looking to do to try to make that as enticing as possible uh, is to get as much base information that, that whatever group it is, whether it's a private developer or a cooperative, get, try to get the base information that they are going to need when they make their, their decisions. So how many kilometers of road needs, needs to be built? Uh, really key in terms of fi figuring out the, the viability of any, any development. Um, hydro lines, uh, you know, uh, what, what permitting is required. So even if, even if a developer uh, it comes forward from the private sector and wants to do that, Thompson 2020 will be there to help them to work through those processes, subdivision process, for example. And so we're trying to push that along as far as, as possible to the point where we're even looking for uh, some resources to be able to uh, actually do conceptual design, like pay somebody who knows what they're doing instead of me uh, to do a conceptual design of a, of a cottage subdivision. Because I think that, that it, it, it'll, it's really at that, that point that'll, uh, that will 
uh, get people's interest and get developers' interest if we can actually uh, get people to actually point at a map and say, yeah, I'd invest there. Um, and uh, for them to tell a developer or to go to, a, go to uh, a group looking at setting up a cooperative. So uh, we're building that information now. We don't want to just put a bunch of blobs on the map and say, let us know if you're interested. What we'd like to do is have those identified areas on the map. We'd like to have conceptual drawings for where the, we think the road would go, uh, what the lot layout would look like, what the size of lots are, uh, some information about servicing, uh, and have all that information go out in that RFP so that we're so that it's more attractive for for people to look at for development. Whether they want to develop this year, or two years or five years from now, we want that to be. We want to sort of advance that project to a point where it's not going to slide back anymore. We've got we're not advancing projects that are that are going to get vetoed because of the surface interests of the mining sector, for example. We're, we're trying to pre-clear as much of that as possible. The other one that came out of a bunch of our discussions is, uh, is a strong interest in another campground uh, in the region, and uh, so that's going to go in the RFP. We've identified an area that would be suitable for that. Uh, again, sort of pre-cleared uh, and put that into the RFP to, uh, to see if there is, is interest. I'm going to circle back to that, that one when I talk about Project 3 and, uh, um, and looking at opportunities for, um, for, people to, you know, for people to invest in the community. Are there any questions about that before I move on to Project 3? Dave. In regard to uh, the first topic you were talking about, the land and like that for moving, like there has in the past many, many years, like when I first came to town, uh, back in 79, just a few years after that, they were looking at land right next to the golf course. They even cut, they even cut the, uh, the ground and stuff like that, and then it just completely changed. So are, are you looking at things, old surveyed properties or old Absolutely. projects? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to be building on existing planning that's been done. Okay. Uh, and that's, you talk about low-hanging fruit. That one's in the city limits. It's got a road. Yeah. Uh, it's off the highway. And, uh, in fact, a developer was interested in that. Uh, and so... Um, We'll be, we'll be including that in the package, for sure. But it won't be the only site. There will, there will be others as well. Uh, so Project 3, uh, in our shorthand, is business redevelopment uh, and business attraction. Uh, and I'll, I'll first of all declare that Projects 2 and 3 have received the least attention from us. Uh, project 1, which I'll end the presentation with, is the one related to workforce adjustment, and it's been the one with the most pressing need We've really had to, uh, um, I won't say scramble, but we've had to put a bunch of our effort into, into Project 1. That's why I'm saving it for the last. We've got some very current updates on that. Project 3 is, um, is focused on, on trying to look at uh, opportunities where people who are already active in Thompson, businesses that are already active in Thompson, in some cases their biggest constraint might have been available, availability of a workforce, we think that they might be able to, some of those, uh, those organizations can take advantage of the fact that we've got a workforce coming available in 2018, and they might be able to expand their business uh, to serve the, serve the region. They might be looking for regional partners. So we're trying to identify that list of opportunities uh, for services, uh, retail, um, construction, uh, you name it, the full list of, of potential uh, um, operations that could, that, uh, that could expand or could be introduced into Thompson. We had, uh, we had a workshop that was facilitated by Growth Enterprise and Trade. Some of you were there. It was uh, Ruth Mealy uh, facilitated that. That was back in November. Uh, we're, we've now taken the results of that and are, um, are breaking the project into sort of two pieces, and we've got uh, support from uh, CEDF, so Oswald, you, everybody knows Oswald, and, and Tim from North Central Development, are each taking a portion of that. Oswald's focus, CEDF's focus, is going to be on local capacity to expand and take on new opportunities, as well as interest in, in expansion. One of the keys that we heard from the presentation from Ruth Mealy was small communities, 
uh, fall into a trap of looking for investors from outside to come and grow their economy. And there are some valid opportunities out there, but the stats are clear. 80% of your investment is going to come from people who are already invested in, their, in your community. And so you shouldn't miss the opportunity to engage people locally who are already invested and ask them if they are interested in, in looking at new opportunities. Whether that be an existing business branching out into, a, into, into another, uh, another opportunity or simply diversifying and, and expanding their own, their own operations. So that is the low-hanging fruit in economic development. Uh, uh, Ruth was absolutely clear about that. All of the research, all of her experience, uh, years of experience in rural economic development has, has informed that opinion. So we are um, looking to focus on, and that's sort of the piece that Oswald is, is looking at. The second part, uh, North Central Development, and we just got off a conference call uh, with Gord Wakeling. We, uh, many of us know Gord. Uh, is going to be gathering information from, uh, uh, from the community and from uh, some public sources and looking at developers to find out what are the metrics that, that are triggers for uh, large chains, uh, large organizations. What are the metrics that they use when they decide to invest or not invest? We've had several requests and it's been ongoing for years and we've all seen it where, well, I, I heard about this store, can we go in and talk to them? Can we in, entice them to invest here? The response from people in commercial real estate has been consistent. No amount of goodwill, no amount of good stories is going to get a chain to invest in Thompson or in any community. They are going to use indicators that drive their decisions. The key is making sure that they are using good information that the information avail that's publicly available is correct, that it doesn't need to be adjusted based on our regional, um, uh, our regional reality, our, our service area. We all know that we service a large area. In a lot of cases, the information available to them may not be correct. So that's one of the pieces is to try to figure out what is gettable and what is doable. And some of those, I, I don't want to sound like I'm contradicting my first statement about local investors. Some, in some cases, it might be looking at national organizations, chains, uh, or outside organizations, uh, corporate, large, large corporate entities that are already invested here that may not have good information about what the region can do for them and convincing them to expand locally or, or, or do those ones. Again, it's the low-hanging fruit. So I don't want to drone on, but that's, that's the work of Project 3. What you're going to see... Uh, coming up, once we've gathered some of that, that information, is a local investors meeting that's going to be coordinated through Thompson 2020, and it'll have participation from uh, North Central Development and CEDF to talk about those opportunities. And that's the one that comes in would be, I mean, one of several that, that, uh, will, that came out of our, our workshop is uh, property development, uh, what the market is for, for cottage area development and if there's interest in that, campground, uh, service opportunities, um, and, and, and looking at what it, uh, interest there is and capacity locally to invest in those, those opportunities. So that's project two. We've done it backwards, project two and project three. Um, and I, as I mentioned, a bunch of our sort of immediate work has been uh, focused on on uh, project one, as I mentioned, the the uh, website is launched. One of the big ones on the on the website is a career fair. So as we know, we've already gone through sort of two waves of of workforce uh, changes of of people who have, who have, uh, are looking for work as a result of the reductions at Valet. Uh, and so we're tr we're working hard to try to line up what opportunities are available in the region. And what opportunities might be available in a related field um, that, uh, that, that people might be interested in. And, and we're, uh, our first, I think, of probably several job fairs is taking place, place February uh, 2 to 3, uh, 2018. Uh, so that's Friday uh, the 2nd from 6 to 8 p.m., Saturday 9 to 3 at the UCN main campus. Um, and I, I'll go into a little bit more detail 
there's a push on this week. We've, we've pulled in some uh, large-scale employers who are going to have a presence at that job fair. This week, uh, my colleague Tim Gibson uh, and a uh, uh, gentleman from, uh, from uh, workplace, workplace Training are going to be blitzing the community to, to look at other people in locally who want to participate in that job fair. One of the big ones that we found, again, this is low-hanging fruit, is uh, uh, Class 1 driver training. So we've got employers who are ready to hire Class 1 drivers. Uh, we're running a course starting in, uh, Keisha, what's, <coughs> starting this month on Class 1 driver training with eight seats that are full. Um, so that's the first piece, of, first training package where we've lined up jobs that are available local, locally, the training to match people up and people to fill those seats. That's one of, we hope, several, a, a series of different training uh, opportunities that we're going to, to be running through that system. And at the same time, we want to assess interest. So we've got some national organizations coming in uh, for the second and third who are looking for a portable workforce, are looking for a mobile workforce to work elsewhere, but, but are interested in, in working out of Thompson. Uh, or you know, flying out of Thompson to, to work in different locations. Uh, there are some local opportunities and there are some opportunities like, like that as well that we're pursuing. So it's really getting that process started. So just a little bit more on uh, the job fair. Um, the term is training for jobs. Uh, training doesn't take place nowadays. It certainly doesn't get funded if there isn't a job at the end of it. It's so class one driver training I mentioned, heavy duty mechanics, heavy equipment operator training, um, our expectation is that we'll actually have uh, the uh, simulators uh, on site uh, that weekend for people to, uh, to try out. Uh, they're making arrangements with that now. Um, uh, CETA is, the, uh, is an industrial services organization that's coming in, HUD Bay. And then, and then for those remote, uh, uh, for, we're going to have some general presentations on what the types of jobs are like. So skilled trades, presentations, what camp life is like. A lot of the jobs that are out there are, are camp based and heavy equipment operator. Uh, next steps, you're going to see some more communication. We've been late in getting the website going. We're pleased to get it launched. Uh, it's still a work in progress, but it's at least there. The survey is there. Uh, we're establishing a social media presence. Uh, I'm, I'm still dating myself by even leading with a conversation about website. Uh, most people that are uh, successful at reaching people are, are not doing it with their website, they're doing it through social media. And so uh, we're getting those, uh, that social media presence uh, launched as well. And we are looking for more local participation. As I mentioned, uh, we've got uh, a project team on Project 1 that includes community members who have come forward and said, I want to be a part of this workforce transition work. We've got a team established for a small team on Project 2, which is the Retain and Attack, Attract Residents. They, they're the ones who develop that survey that you're going to see. And they're going to be facilitating those, uh, those focus groups. Uh, and Project 3, as I said, we're going to be engaging people through uh, an investor's breakfast where we talk about uh, what opportunities we see out there, what the data says, what, we're, what we've learned, and identify those opportunities and see if people come forward. We do have... Um, might, some people might find it hard to believe, but we've got people who are already locally invested coming forward with ideas. Uh, we've got some external organizations looking to, uh, uh, looking to invest as well. One of the ones that I never, ever would have dreamt uh, this one uh, had to climb the learning curve. I haven't even started climbing the learning curve, but believe it or not, I've used the word cryptocurrency more in the last week than I have in the rest of my life. We actually have interest from some organizations looking to set up the cryptocurrency mining uh, centers. Don't ask me what that is. I know a little bit about it, but I know that someone's looking to develop uh, capacity here. We have a natural advantage because we've got a lot of uh, transmission lines and some infrastructure here that other places don't have. And so that's an active, a very active discussion. We're meeting with a proponent at 2.30 this afternoon on the phone. I wouldn't have believed that if you had told me that, that I was going to be doing that last week. Um, so we are, we are getting some, uh, um, 
specific requests in. Um, anything that we can do to try to diversify the, the economy and attract investment, we're, we're open to ideas. So feel free to contact me. Uh, afterwards, we, I can leave. Uh, I didn't bring handouts. I just finished the presentation before coming over here. But uh, uh, I, can, uh, I think that we've, I can leave with, uh, with you the contact information for our, uh, for our group if, if people haven't seen that. Any questions at all, I'd be happy to, uh, to address them now. Ron. Website name for those of us with short-term problems. Yeah, yeah, me too. I'm looking down on my list. www.thompson2020.ca And I might have fibbed a little bit. Keisha, like 10 minutes ago when I looked at the site, the, the link didn't load for the survey for me. Can we check on that? Okay, so we'll, we can address that then. Okay, thank you. Uh, Wally. A couple things. Um, so Valet, we're losing five to 700 jobs by the end of the year. They're all high paying jobs. What do we have in Thompson that can replace those high paying jobs? And what are we doing to attract those type of businesses to invest, such as a uh, manufacturing firm or something that can be done on the outskirts of the city or whatever to bring a large corporation in that needs hundreds of jobs that maybe might consider us. And the second question is, there, there was a plan and there was approval at some time of building a center here recently for um, heavy duty mechanics and so forth. It was supposed to be with UCN and Artie Parker congruently. And what has happened to that? I understand it's off the table, but yet we're talking about that. What can we do to get that back in? That one's back on the table. That that one is, and I didn't mention it by name, but that's that's core to to uh, core component of project one. Uh, project one has three pieces. One of them is career planning, uh, and one on one work with the with the, the affected employees. Um, it's seven hundred positions. It won't end up being seven hundred people, just so that we know. But it is certainly high paying jobs that are that are that are gone. Um, but working one on one with the people who are affected. Uh, and that work is being uh, done by the Northern Sector Council, which is part of the it's a training organization related to industrial uh, uh, partners. And looking at career planning and looking at what people's education are, what their interests are. Um, and so there's, that's, that's 1A is what we call that, Project 1A. 1B is that piece you're talking about. Uh, it used to be called the uh, ISTTC, Integrated Skills Training, Trades Training Center. Uh, that's being sort of repackaged as the uh, Northern Workforce Development Center, and it's very much an active um, uh, project where we want to have a dedicated center that is nimble, looking at what jobs are there, uh, whether they be industrial jobs <coughs> or whether they be uh, service center sector jobs, tourism jobs, and, and really uh, is a sort of an, an enduring program, not a short-term adjustment program for two years, but an enduring entity uh, as part, you know, as part of UCN, but other education organizations that is constantly programming training uh, in small cohorts, like for five people, 10 people, 20 people, and looking at what, and it's connected to jobs. So, so doing what we did to generate the, um, the, the, the bundle uh, for um, class one driver training, say, listen, there's a need there. We can do a we can do a class of eight. Eight makes sense for the people who deliver it. Who delivers it? How do we collect the money? How do we we fund it? And then, ideally, that gets while that's underway, we're planning the next one. And so, we're doing that right now with the 2020 team, but eventually that gets, in our view, that gets handed off to that that uh, that center, uh, that that training center. Um, in terms of manufacturing and replacing those jobs, I don't want to promise that we're that that's a thing that we can that we can commit to doing. We don't know that that, that those 700 you know industrial paying jobs are are there to get for here. Certainly, we're open to all kinds of uh, ideas. We're we're putting feelers out all the time, um, and uh, we're open to different connections. We've got. Um, uh, you know, we've got a, a history of pursuing uh, different opportunities, cold weather testing being one of them, right, and, uh, and leveraging off of that. 
Other services in the north, we think uh, construction are areas where we have a history of serving the north. Uh, partnerships with First Nations uh, in those areas, I think there's there are lots of opportunities to, to grow. So we're in that business development one. We are we're we're looking at all options. But I, I, I don't know if it's as easy as just say, saying, well, we want to put a manufacturing site out of, out of town. I wish it was, but um, that's, we're, I don't want to throw cold water on it, but for sure we are looking at all, all kinds of options for, the, for that. Danielle? When you're talking amenities, are you guys including what's available for families? Like, I've got friends in Winnipeg that consider it they win the lottery if they can get their kids into swimming lessons. Yeah. And they crashed the 311 website with trying to sign their kids up for swimming lessons. Like, my son's in TNT, he skis, he bowls, like, he's in so much, and I don't yeah. live in my car. Yeah, yeah, no, I... And that's a, like, I've got friends in Winnipeg that have their kids, and they essentially live in their car. Yeah, yeah, because I, they're driving one kid one way all over. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I work with a, work with a woman who has, has got three kids, twin 15-year-olds and a 10-year-old. They're all athletes. I don't know if she lives in her car. Like, that's, I mean, I don't want to knock it, but it's a tough go. I mean, Thompson is an embarrassment of activities for kids, for families. Like, we have just got so many things to do. And I can literally put a pot on to boil and take my kid to the rink and come back before it's, before I need to put the pasta in, right? And so um, I think that we've, the survey I think has enough opportunity for people to identify things. It's not all going to be check boxes. Identifying which, um, it's, it's not just saying what, cert, what amenities you want, but it's also what amenities are important to you. So identifying things that already exist is also really helpful to us, right? In understanding how important the Norplex pool is, or the ski hill, or uh, the health services, or, you know, things like that. Those are all uh, possibilities. And, to try to make it as short as possible, sorry, Pauletta, you know I'm a talky-talky guy. Uh, we, there's a bit of an off-ramp in there. If your big issue is health services, it takes you to a section where there's more detail. If you don't identify health services as a big driver for you, it doesn't make you go through all of those questions. So we're trying to, we tried to make it as, as easy as possible because I think at different stages in people's lives, different things are important, right? And so that's... That was our hope. We're, we're all a well-intentioned group of people who I think maybe one of us had been involved in doing a survey before. So this is our best effort. Guaranteed we're going to find some things that we wish we'd added later on or a question that was, could have been worded better. Paulette? Um, when you were speaking about the availability for um, training, a new career, is there any subsidies that are attached to that, or is that the responsibility of the person who is now unemployed who wants to find, so, a, job, find a job and get training? Um, I'm trying to climb that learning curve. Okay. But the, from what I've understood from the presentations I've been to, funding is available for people to, who, have, who are on uh, unemployment insurance or employment insurance who are collecting, there's, there's pretty good funding available uh, for them. And, and based on, because of the, it's location specific, and I don't remember the details, but there, there is funding available. Now, the challenge for us is it took us longer to do the class one driver training than we would have liked. We identified that re basically right at the time that the birch tree closure was planned but hadn't happened yet. And frankly, we should have run two classes through by now. Um, and that's a challenge for us. It's something we gotta get we gotta get good at that. And we need to we need to figure out ways to get that pipeline open. The funding source is the province. Um, they don't, but there's a criteria, and I'm not laying, laying the blame on on education training, but there's a they've got a checklist to go through. Uh, they've got to be satisfied that there's jobs at the end of that. They've got and then we we line up the trainer, the location, all of those pieces. We're not good at it yet, uh, but the funding is there uh, if there's if there's jobs attached to it, and we can do a reasonable cohort, right? We're not going to we're going to train someone to be a helicopter pilot because they want to be a helicopter pilot, and there's a job somewhere, right? That certain training you don't do here, but some of it you can, and and those recipients uh, there's a process where they apply as well, right? So the short answer is yes, there's support for that. Hope that answers your question.
Dennis. And further to that, um, North Central Development, in conjunction with uh, training uh, employment services, uh, for those people who are unemployed and receiving EI or go through CVI, there is funding available to help them get uh, into their own business, and we will help them do that through the EI. You can collect EI benefits and earn money in your own business if you want to uh, <coughs> do that. There's um, other funding available to help them get going, such as uh, uh, training, uh, family care, this type of thing. So Appreciate there, 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 yeah. there are vehicles out there that will help you. It's not a lot of money, but it certainly is a, a yeah. start. And it's not just a job, and it's also not just people who are displaced uh, before they're retired. There's also a tremendous resource and tremendous amount of skill and capacity available among people who are retiring. And we don't want to lose them either, right? They might be interested in starting a business. They might be interested in retraining for another job. A lot of people are retired and they're, I want to date myself, but they're people that I went to high school who are retired uh, this year from Valet. And, and they, they're, a lot of them are interested in picking up other work. Right, and retraining or, or doing something else. We don't want to lose sight of, of those opportunities either. Obviously the greatest need are people who, who weren't at that stage of retirement and they're look, you know, but I've, we defined it as are you looking for work, not are you, uh, are you laid off or retired. It's are you looking, are you looking for work because if so, we, we're, we want to have a conversation with you. Freddie, you, had, a, you look, had your hand up there. Yeah, um, I don't know how much promotion is done with the university. Recently, I was in Winnipeg, and, and uh, two, two or three of the restaurants here have young ladies and young guys working at them that are actually here going to university because they could not get into the courses down there with folk. Is it being promoted the way it should be? Because uh, talking to some young people in Winnipeg over a week ago, they weren't even aware we had a university here, yet we've got about, I think, a half a dozen young nurses training, and they will get better nurse training here than they will in the university in the south. Because they get more hands-on. More experience. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, we... Uh, I'm... Uh, I, I don't get into their kitchen too much in terms of how, telling them to do their job, but we we are side-by-side side with them on the employment training piece and uh, and know that we've got a, a resource there. It's a, it's a, it's a gem of a, of a facility and a program that probably could grow, right? Could use more, more, more promotion. Hi there. Health services, something that's on your radar, because it's obviously a problem here to yeah. get and to see the doctor or anything, right? So that's, I imagine, especially for the retirement age group, a big factor. Yeah, yeah. We had uh, a couple of retirees on our on our team doing the survey, and that's one of those little off ramps. If health is important uh, important for you as a decision maker, then it takes you to a, a, a more detailed list of questions. We had an interesting conversation about that because of. Uh, of uh, um, the stuff around Niverville and the MRI, uh, we had a had a conversation around MRIs, right? And because that's the f sort of the first thing that comes to mind. But we actually we anxious to see what the survey comes back with. But uh, I act my own view is I don't think a lot of people decide where they're going to live based on where the, how fast they can get an MRI. We think that I don't, I don't, I would, no, I wouldn't worry so much about the MRI. But I mean, for me to get an appointment to get my child into the doctor, yes. I'm waiting three months. And it's yeah. the same thing for everybody at any age. That's level. right. So especially that age group, yeah. that's a huge concern. Yeah, and so uh, what I, I think it's, it's, it's regular access to services that are, are big ones, like dialysis, like foot care, like, uh, you know, those I think are, the, are, are some of the things that really people worry about more than, uh, because an MRI, hopefully you never need one in your life, but if you do, it's once or twice, right? It's, you know... It's not a, it's not a, it's not, we don't think it's key, but it's in there as a, as a thing, as a, as a question. So if healthcare is one of your big ones, you get the full tour on healthcare and an opportunity to provide feedback about what is important to you. So then that can drive our planning as well as the, the city's efforts in terms of lobbying and our community's efforts, not just the city's, but our community's efforts in, in, uh, in pushing for services. So we, we want as many people as possible to, to put the effort into, into filling out that survey so we can point to data when we're going forward.
right, and say this is this is a real big driver for us. Where, where can we drop off the hard copies? At City Hall, or uh, we can have collection at City Hall for sure. So yeah, I, I don't know if it's is it printable off the site or do we uh, pick up hard? That's the link, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah. But but if just to add the online link for those who are um, computer savvy, <laughs> it's much easier. Yeah. So I would encourage you. All my seniors don't have computers. No, so. no. <laughs> but if but you know, Pam, if we can get you hard directly. Yeah. We can get you some hard copies. And if anyone else wants hard copies, then I, I'll just ask you to see Keisha. Um, and we can we can supply hard copies. If people want hard copies at their businesses at the uh, at the front counter, yeah. by all means, we we encourage that. We'll figure out a way to take those and, and just enter them ourselves and and back end them. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. I want to thank everyone here for your time and attention. I appreciate that.